Jesus and the Boys. There they are. Uh, I like Dan Brown's book a lot. I uh, like Mike, Michael Bajan's book a lot. Not because I think they're right or that they're nonfiction. Bajan's book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, claims to be nonfiction. But I think it's been fairly thoroughly refuted now by historians in terms of this secret organization, the Priory of Zion, and all this stuff. But what a great story. I mean, just suspend your judgment, go watch the movie and enjoy it. Car scenes, murders, whippings, beatings, romance, love, sex. I mean, it's, it's a great American film. And it's touching at the end. Um, I think when Sophie and uh, Tom Hanks' character are talking right at the end, what would it be like for our world and for religion to recover a human Jesus? I found that sort of moving in that last little touch where she puts her toe in the water and goes, not yet. <laughs> it's just, I thought that was good in some ways better than the book. Also, The Secret Supper, the novel, I would really recommend for this painting because it's much more historical, even though it's a novel. But, I mean, you've got to give Dan Brown credit for bringing to the attention of the world these sorts of questions. And yes, uh, where's my pointer? That does look like Mary Magdalene, come to think of it. <laughs> and maybe, maybe Defensi, you know, was telling us something. I'm not sure what he might have been telling us there. But it's just very, it's interesting to do things like this and to name these other apostles and their postures and how they're turned and so forth. So, let's name them. Um, no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. Okay, everybody can get the first four. Not everybody, but most people. They roll off your tongue because they're the fisherman brothers, right? So that's four. Four, twelve. Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas. If you work a little bit, you might have trouble remembering all four, but you usually get those. Something said about all eight of those. A lot said about Peter. Quite a bit said about uh, James and John, a little bit about Philip and so forth. But if you take the gospel accounts, you know s some little snippet of a story, Thomas being quite famous in terms of John. Then it gets harder. Ah, ah he, okay, we're up to nine, three to go. And none of my students, I know some of you uh, know this already, but none of my students can get the last three ever now that my book's out and they've read it and they know they better read it before the course. <laughs> they, they know, but it's hard to get the last three. Nine plus three is twelve. So. Not for the last three. Uh, James, the blue names are consistent. Judas, also called Thaddeus, which means sort of courageous of heart. He's, everybody has nicknames. And Shimon, Zelotes or Kananitas, which is Canaanite, is not good. Kanan in Hebrew means to, to buy or to be zealous, so it's almost the same name. And it might not be zealot politically, like the political party. It might be the, the devoted one. You know, you're zealous, like you're ready to just do anything. Uh, so we've got those. So, uh, now I've got to figure out what I'm doing here. I just wanted to do the name the apostles thing to start. So now let's go back and start the show. Okay. In our earliest record of Jesus and the boys, it's a verse in Mark that is edited by Matthew and removed by Luke. Luke's not real interested in the family. And so he knows Mark. Mark is a source of Luke. And he doesn't uh, give the names. Matthew gives the names, but he uh, changes this to Joseph, which makes it more standard. This is a nickname. Joseph or Yosef in Greek, it's, it's kind of an affectionate name, like little Joey, little Josie. Uh, and Mark knows that. He knows that because I think he knows who this is. Uh, you know how Mark will say, who carried the cross, Alexander? Oh, yeah, he's the father of 
Simon and who's the other one? Do you remember Alexander? I think he says, you know, he knows uh, he knows <laughs> things like that. Judas and Simon. He doesn't name the sisters. Also, he calls Jesus the son of Mary, and Matthew fixes that a bit to say the son of Mary and Joseph. Also, the text, you know, Bart Ehrman's point about the texts go wild whenever there's a problem. You know, textual variants all of a sudden get thick, like you get three columns of them, if there's any kind of problem. And right here, that's a problem in Judaism. You never, ever, ever call a person the son of their mother. If I land at Tel Aviv Airport and fill out that landing card, I put Jimmy Dan Tabor, son of father's first name, right? I have to put my father's first name. Oded Galan is on trial for forging the James Ossuary. Did you read the indictment? It's on the web. Oded Galan, son of, and I forgot his father's name, but first name. It's a very old tradition. Son of Mary, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, what happened there? <laughs> Either you don't know or you don't say. There's two ways to get pregnant. <laughs> uh, and so it's just not proper. And, and, and yet Mark uh, records that. He doesn't have a birth story, so I, I don't know how he explained it other than just his silence. Now... This is not very in focus. I just took it on Monday in Ein Karim at the Church of the Annunciation. No, wait. This is actually the, out at Jericho at the Greek Orthodox Church of Gerasimus. But even though it's not in focus, I think you can make it out. We've got Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus going to Egypt. And who is leading the donkey there? Who would that be? It's James. Because James is older than Jesus in the Eastern tradition, and he is the son of Joseph by a previous marriage. So see, here we have an icon that actually uh, makes James the uh, brother of Jesus, but not from Mary. Now, the handout, uh, the only reason I didn't want you to have it is it lists the t names of the 12 apostles. So, <laughs> so just listen. Now, the question is, if Mary is the mother, who is the father or who are the fathers? What I explore in the book that I wrote are all the possibilities. I give the Western view, the Eastern view, the Protestant view, uh, and then I also play around with the text a little bit to see if we can come up with other things. I don't know which is correct. And short of DNA evidence of the tomb of Jesus, I don't know that we'll ever know. And so, but I think we should be aware of all the possibilities. My working assumption as a historian and as a just a rational human being is that Jesus had a father. I think if I were filling out the birth certificate, I would put unknown because I don't know. But I do think it was a person who walked the earth. So that's an assumption of mine that others don't share. So obviously there could be a parting the ways there. But in terms of the mother, we'll stay away from the father until tomorrow. In terms of the mother, uh, all children have mothers. So all children don't have fathers, according to some people, but everybody seems to think you know, that they have mothers. So we can talk about the mother. Now, Mary, the wife of Joseph. This is Miriam. I really wish we would drop these Greek names. We should be calling James Yaakov, Jacob, because that's really his name. We should be calling Mary Miriam. It just gives a better flavor. Then if Miriam has seven children, Baruch Hashem, because that's what a Jewish mother should do, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And you wouldn't think that was unholy. But when you call her Mary, Mary, Holy Mother of God, it gives a, another, you're entering another culture. You're entering a Hellenistic Greek culture in which sexuality is deemed as low and spirituality and celibacy is deemed as high. In Judaism, in terms of just mainstream tradition, sexuality is deemed as high and not having children is a curse and is deemed as low. So you get this completely different evaluation 
of uh, what it is to be a human in this world. So Mary, wife of Joseph, mother of Jesus, I put him in brackets because, you know, the paternity thing is, is handled differently. But she is in Mark, we just looked at, she is the mother of James, Joseph, and Simon. Now, the Joseph is the key here, folks, because it's a nickname. At the crucifixion, you see, look at the one that says, uh, Jesus dynasty, James and the brothers at Jerusalem, getting the name straight. Brothers of Jesus, we just did. At the crucifixion, we've got Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less, and of Joseph, or Joseph. But in Mark, again, he sticks with this. But this Mary is called the sister of this Mary, wife of Clophus, brother of Joseph, when you put it all together. Now think about this. A family with two Marys, which would be a bit odd. Mary, who's married to a Joseph. Mary, who's married to a Clophus, who's the brother of Joseph, who have three kids, James, Joseph, and Simon, James, Joseph, and Simon. So what I suggest is you just want to merge those together. In other words, this Mary is this Mary. She is the wife of Joseph, but she's also the wife of Clophus because Joseph dies childless. That's something I present as a possibility in the book. Now, the problem with that, I suppose, is that it would make, uh, I, we would have to decide who is the fathers of four boys and uh, the girls as well. You know, six all together. So it becomes, uh, actually not four. We're, we're leaving out uh, Jude. He's not listed here. But... <laughs> on, on this little uh, chart. Now, we already did this. We already did this. Now, I'd, I also, uh, Eisenman talks about this, and I, I think he's probably right. I essentially developed it. He doesn't say what I say. He doesn't go as far as to say they're of the 12, but he does talk about the names. That nothing is said about these three. I can give you at least one story for the nine. Every one of them, there's no stories about these at all. You know, like a little anecdote, just one little word. So a few years ago, the BBC was doing a series on the disciples, and they contracted me to be one of the people that work with them. And they had, you know, a whole program on Peter, of course, Peter the Apostle. I think they, obviously, a whole program on Judas Iscariot, lots of traditions about him, and they didn't have the Judas Gospel. Uh, this James is a fisherman. These are brothers. These two are brothers. These two are brothers. Uh, I think they clustered these together, and they might have clustered these together and put Andrew with them. I'm not sure. But anyway, they, it was going to be ten programs. So they really, Thomas, they had going to India and doing, you know, they could do Gospel of Thomas. They could do Doubting Thomas. Plenty of footage, plenty of art, plenty of paintings. They don't even have drawings of these guys except Da Vinci and Da Vinci's painting. And no stories. So guess who got assigned that program? <laughs> one hour. They want one hour on these guys. And I said, if you'll let me do the brother of Jesus thing, we can do two hours on it. If they're not the brothers of Jesus, the show will be five minutes with lots of commercials. Think about it. Because what would you say? Oh, yeah, there were these three guys, James, Judas, and Simon, but we don't know anything about them. They just sort of wandered around at the end of the trail. Uh, it's just curious to me. First of all, Alpheus and Clophus in Hebrew, chalaf with a chet, uh, are very, very similar, if not the same word. I think they're the same word. And uh, the names J James, Judas, and Simon uh, are three of the brothers actually named. And I began to wonder about, is it possible that uh, among the 12 at the tail end never mentioned are the brothers of Jesus. It would have to do with the traditions that we get and have. Whoops. Now, if that's the case, the 12 were at the Last Supper, right? Jesus gathers with the 12. In that Ebionite gospel handout that you got the first day, the last text 
has James at the Last Supper, and he says, you know, Jesus says, I will not eat, drink of this cup until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom of God. And James says, I will not eat and drink until I see you again. He's there. Here's Durer's painting. Isn't this interesting? Dan Brown didn't know this. Who's that little boy? That's the beloved disciple. He looks kind of little, doesn't he? Uh, James the Less, he's called in the text at the cross. Remember Mary, the mother of James the Less. Hakaton in Hebrew means the little one, the small one, the young one. Young one probably would. I don't think it necessarily means stature, but uh, the kid, Billy the kid, the young one. It's an affectionate term. You know, you say, where's the little one? Where's James, my, my, my little brother? Now he, uh, what I'm, of course, what I'm suggesting is that uh, Joseph is not the father of Jesus. That's good for everybody, right? Uh, he's not the father of Jesus. Jesus has some other father, but he, and he's not the father of these other kids as well. But his brother Clophus, James, son of Clophus, Alpheus, is the father in a Leverate marriage. And so they're separated by some years. And I don't know if Durer is exactly right, but I think that's kind of moving. He leans on Jesus' breast. This is not exactly culturally set to the theme of a Hellenistic meal. But, you know, we got the wooden medieval table. But I do like the idea of the affection of the little kid kind of falling asleep and uh, Jesus petting him and holding him. It pushes it too far, but I, I, I think it's a, a moving thing. Now, at the cross, by the way, in my book I had, I wish they could have been color. I wanted them to be, but it gets so expensive to do color plates. I have 11 paintings commissioned by Baloge. Balage, he's the best archaeological artist around. And I essentially was able to describe to him what I wanted. And he would draw it, this Roman clothing, the shields, the standards, the spears, every single thing. This one doesn't show as much detail. It's all according to archaeology and history. He knows all of this. So I said, well, I want a crucifixion scene. I want it on the Mount of Olives. I want the women uh, standing around and a few followers, the Roman soldiers gathered overlooking the temple, because I think this is more likely the spot where it happened. Now, right here is James, or excuse me, the beloved disciple. Look, he's comforting Mary. And this is the other, this is uh, Salome, the sister, and another of the women, another uh, Mary Magdalene. This could be Mary Lang, and he didn't make it real detailed. But these are, the, these are the three, these are the four that are at the cross. And Jesus, in the John tradition, says to the one standing holding the mother, Son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son, which in Judaism would be the official act of transition, that the eldest son is always in charge of the household, and he's saying to his brother, uh, It's you now. You know, I've had this family for all these years. Our dads are gone, plural, and you are the one. Now, that's revolutionary. Eisenman's the first one I know to ever suggest it. I learned it from him. I got convinced of it uh, on my own for other additional reasons. Uh, Charles Worth wrote a book called The Beloved Disciple. It goes over every possibility that's ever been suggested. This is the one mentioned six times in the Gospel of John from the Last Supper on the one he loved, the one he loved, the one he loved, and the last scene we have here before his death, at least. And Charles Worth uh, finally ends up saying it's Thomas, of all people. Traditionally, it's John the Fisherman. We have two stories of John the Fisherman. One is that he wants to call fire from heaven and burn a village that didn't listen. And the other is he wants to sit at the right position of Jesus and have the first place. And Jesus, in both cases, rebukes him rather strongly and says, you don't know what spirit you're of. 
So I don't know if that qualifies as the one we'd call the beloved. Now, there are later traditions. They get mushy about, oh, the beloved John, he walked around in Asia. Bless you, bless you, my children, bless you, love. Maybe he had a transition. But in terms of the New Testament records, the one Jesus loved, the one who leaned on his breast, doesn't seem to be that fisherman as far as I can tell. And why would Jesus turn the community over to his brother James, but then his mother over to this guy that had really sought to burn people and to have preeminence? You know, it just, I couldn't compute that, so I couldn't fit that together. So I suggest that he's the beloved disciple. But the repercussions of that are pretty amazing because that would mean that that witness in the Gospel of John at the end, and we know this disciple and his testimony is true, would indeed be James. And that fits very well with your work, April, in terms of you know, James being at the center of this whole thing. So I don't know, it's a hypothesis. I don't know that it can be proven, but I think it's worth thinking about. Clearly the two dominant figures in Christian memory, this is the El Greco, are Peter and Paul. Can you tell which is which? <laughs> right? Uh, and if you go to St. Pat's in New York and you walk in that wonderful cathedral, on one side is Peter, on the other side is Paul. If you go to the Vatican, you also see Peter and Paul. James the Less is definitely the Less because he's nowhere to be found in lots of Christian artwork. Now, Paul did not put it this way. When Paul names the pillars of the church in Galatians, he is a little sarcastic, the so-called pillars of the church, but he does name them. Uh, it's Peter and John, but James first. And I think in Judaism, the order in which you name things is always important, right? So uh, when Mark puts those apostles at the last, those last three, and Judas at the very last, he's basically saying the important ones are the first four and then the next four, and then, of course, there's those other people, and then there's Judas, who's the least. So that's what we've inherited. So as far as James and the brothers, uh, back to your sheet here, turn it over to the back. We'll go back one thing here. This is from Shanks' book with uh, Ben Witherington. It's a nice little summary. It's the clearest I've seen in any book. You know, you just get one, two, three, four. Full brothers. Mary and Joseph had all these kids. There they are. So that tends to be the Protestant picture, tends to be the picture of lots of scholars. It's the simplest. I think Bart Ehrman would go for this. Look, there's Mary, there's Joseph, and there's the kids. You know, why get into wild theories, Tabor? Okay, half-brothers. Whenever you don't take number one and you go to two, three, or four, it's almost like you protest too much. Like, why did this, not, this couple not have their children? You know, what is it that we're trying to preserve? Well, what we're trying to preserve is number one and number two. God is the father of Jesus, not uh, Joseph. And then Joseph can have those other children, right? And so they would essentially be half-brothers, but they would be uh, children of Joseph and Mary later. That would be a position, historians tends to be number one, it's simple. This would be pious Protestants who still would say the virgin birth, but it's okay for Mary to have lots of kids later, just so she's had Jesus first with no sex, but after that, you can have sex. Number three, previous wife Joseph has all these kids with a uh, previous wife. Joseph has all these kids with the previous wife. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then marries Mary, and God has Jesus with Mary, so to speak. God is the father of Jesus. That would be pretty much which view? Catholic. Right, the Roman Catholic. Uh, no, not the Roman Catholic. That would be the Eastern Orthodox, because Joseph is still seen as having children. The Western view is number four. 
Uh, all of those children, Jesus and Mary have a child. Joseph is also celibate. He never has sexual relations, even with Mary. So he knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son. Does not mean they had sex. It means they began to have really deep conversations. <laughs> uh, I'm being silly here, but I mean... Sorry, but even John Meyer, whom I admire a great deal at this point, says, well, you know, until doesn't always have to mean until. But, you know, the common reading of that is he didn't begin to cohabit with her until the birth of the child. And presumably after the birth of the child, he did. But not in the Western view, because Joe's sex is not holy. Well, it's not the highest holiness, right? And so Joseph... I mean, this is Joseph, St. Joseph. He doesn't need to be having sex, like taking his clothes off and getting in bed with somebody. And, I mean, I don't want to think of this. You know, it, it is a sensitivity thing. You know, I'm being humorous to cut the tension here, but it is for people. They worry about that. And Mary, I mean, that's really upping the ante. This is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, in modern times... I think we've adjusted to that considerably, probably too much, right, uh, in terms of our own Western understanding of sexuality. Uh, but the Jewish understanding is still out there, which would be sexuality is sacred and is uh, holy, but it's also protected by marriage, and it's not hedonistic, and it's not adulterous or fornication, but it's sacred and holy in its own arena, and uh, you have children. And so then you got this fourth view of the, uh, which is the Eastern, with Clophus having all those children, with another Mary, who's the sister of Mary, sister taken just generically. Not like you would name two girls Mary, but sister meaning what? her companion, her friend, her soulmate, or whatever. So. so those are the views that are standard. And what I suggest is that that number four just needs to be slid over a bit. As you put those all together, number four, and I think it would make better sense uh, for two reasons. First, I think Clophus is a nickname. And secondly, I don't think two brothers would marry two girls named Mary and name all their kids exactly the same names, including the nickname Yosis. I think that's a real key, Yosis. I think I'll name my child Joseph, but I'm going to call him Yosis. Oh, we're going to do that too. And your name's Mary. Yeah, my name's Mary too. <laughs> Did you name yours James? Yeah, we named ours James. What'd you name your third one? Simon? Simon? Oh, that's interesting. We're just really alike, aren't we? So I'm being silly, sorry. Oops. <laughs> so now to be more serious, because this is serious. I took this slide this week, actually, uh, in the Kidron Valley. This is Jerusalem on the east, Mount of Olives behind us, the Absalom Pillar. According to Hegesippus, James is thrown off the corner of the temple down into the Kidron. All of this fill would not be here, so picture the wall going straight on down to there which it does, the foundation stones. So you're talking about a couple of hundred feet down in the valley below. And then he's beaten to death with a club and stoned in 62 AD. James, the brother of Jesus. So that uh, is the end. Jesus, of course, is crucified, and the second brother uh, is clubbed to death. Mary's still alive as far as we know. Our tradition is that she lives on. So think of, in our day, the Kennedys, you know, where it really became uh, a question of uh, how many will we lose? And, you know, Jacqueline in her later years talked about this. And then, of course, uh, when her own son died, it just became unbelievable. So two boys gone. Um, what do we know about James? Well... <laughs> Here we have the ossuary made famous in Bar Magazine with uh, Lemaire's article. Talked a lot, uh, you go to the website, 
the one thing that Herschel Shanks has done that is so commendable, I think, on that website, if you go to that section on fakes and finds and then you go down to James Ossuary, it's a compendium of all the reports and news articles and pros and cons from both sides, all collected in one place. It's just a tremendous source for reading about the question of the authenticity of this ossuary. I'm interested as much as in the inscription. I'm very interested in the inscription, but I'm also interested in where it came from. What does it say? What it says, see, I was ready for you, is Yaakov bar Yosef, James, son of Joseph, Achidu, brother, Ach in Hebrew, with the Aramaic ending, Yeshua. So James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Um, the Israeli IAA, or the case against Oded Galan, is that this was added, that originally it said James, son of Joseph, right there. Brother of Jesus was added to make it valuable. The owner, Oded Galan, says that he had it since uh, the 1970s. And he never really noticed that it was significant, which I think does make us wonder. He says he didn't read Aramaic, and he didn't know Jesus had a brother. But uh, it's, it's very easy to read. It's Hebrew block letters and its names. If I say to my students, my freshman students, Yaakov bar Yosef, any idea what I just said in Aramaic? I just spoke Aramaic to you. Most of them, Yaakov, Bar, they can get the Bar because they know Shimon, Bar, Jonah, Simon, Bar, Jonah. Jesus, son of Joseph, you got it. You know Aramaic. Now, the brother, they might not know, but something of Jesus. Hmm. And if they know any Hebrew at all, they could get it even without the Aramaic. So you wonder about when you buy an ossuary, you buy the ossuary, especially if it has an inscription. That's what makes it interesting to you. Otherwise, it's just an ossuary, like it's a planner. You put it on your back porch. <laughs> but if it has an inscription, it becomes interesting. So I think, rightly, people questioned his story in terms of, uh, is he telling us everything? When did he get it, especially? This would have to do with when he got it, not did he forge it. Because if you got it in the 70s and just never noticed for all those years, that it's a pretty interesting set of names. I mean, it's probably of, of the ossuary inscriptions we have, it would stand out as one of the more interesting because it gives a relationship. Uh, but what really makes us wonder is uh, when he got it. Because if he got it, maybe more, it, it surfaced in, uh, what was it, 202? I think 202, I always forget, 201, 202 in Toronto. But uh, if he only got it maybe the year before or so on, then I could see why he, uh, first of all, it's illegal. But secondly, he couldn't say, well, I just never really noticed, but it would come up on the market. So I just don't know. I don't want to accuse anybody of lying and the trial is still going on, but it's just something we all have to think about. But the more interesting question is, where did it come from? You know, like what tomb? Uh, in the Kidron, this is right below the scene where James is killed, we have the traditional tomb of James right there. Historians and archaeologists do not think this is the tomb of James, but all through the Middle Ages, the Crusader period, through the Middle Ages, this was known as the tomb of James, based upon the idea that James was killed a few yards from here and that he was a prominent figure who was buried at the foot of the Kidron in a monumental tomb. And this is the tomb that uh, was chosen. And in old tour books and so on, you see, they say that's, that's the tomb of James. Um, if you go down the Kidron, you come to the Hinnom Valley, which starts right here, and there's this tomb of the shroud. It's right there. I can almost see it. It would be probably right about there. It's just around the corner right there. And this is the tomb that uh, Gibson and I found in the year 2000. We have wondered whether it came from that tomb. 
because the chronology begins to fit very well. The ossuary, <coughs> the t ossuaries were stolen from that tomb in 2000. 2001, 2002, it surfaces. And if that's the case, this tomb could be the tomb of the Jesus family. And it's essentially, it's still at the foot of the Kidron. I would, I would understand foot of the Kidron to mean, you know, the Kidron goes down like this and out to the Dead Sea. But the foot of it could very well mean right here. Uh, Hegesippus says the tomb is still known to us today. It was a site that's known. And uh, if the tomb of where we found that shroud is the tomb, I cover this in the first chapter of my book, it becomes very intriguing because that we have studied that tomb probably more thoroughly or as thoroughly as almost any tomb uh, since the Caiaphas tomb. And we're going to publish this volume. It's about 200 pages drawings of the ossuaries, DNA tests, everything we can possibly know about it. And, uh, you know, it's, we would like to be able to identify it one way or the other as to whether it might be the Jesus family tomb. But the only way I'd know to do that would be DNA finally, because you could do what's called mitochondrial DNA with the ones we've already tested. Now, the story goes on. James and the boys. James is dead. Simon takes over. Uh, he's called a cousin in the later literature, but he is called son of Clophus. Simon, son of Clophus, a cousin of the Lord. Well, cousin is a loose term. Um, nephew, brother-in-law, half-brother, cousin. You know, like you walk up to somebody and say, cousin terms of like bro or relationship or something like that in slang. Uh, that's what's passed on to us uh, by Eusebius. But since he's the son of Clophus, if Clophus is the father of those other children, as I suggest from those texts, then it would be Jesus' brother. And he's old. Uh, he dies uh, in... Uh, Trajan's reign, and Trajan rules from 107 on, and then he's uh, getting close in his 90s to 100, and he was put in in 62, so um, essentially he is uh, part of what I would call the dynasty. Now, the reason I think the dynasty is a useful concept is that the group is interested in the bloodline connection with Jesus. Uh, they have the spirit of Jesus, and they believe the spirit of Jesus is with them, and there have been manifestations of the spirit of Jesus. But to also have first James and then Simon as leaders, uh, if I'm correct about Simon, Two boys that grew up with Jesus, that were in the same home, who had the same mother, who drank the same mother's milk, both literally and spiritually. And whatever you think of Jesus, I would want to give credit to his extraordinary Jewish mother, that she produced this family of boys that led this movement for uh, almost 100 years. I mean, you've got to say something about what kind of atmosphere they had in their home and what they were like. Uh, why do I show this picture? This is a wadi in Jordan across from where John was baptizing, and it's over this hill right here to the north is Pella. We have a tradition that the church fled, the group, the Nazarenes fled when the Romans surrounded Jerusalem, and they went to the region of Pella, and I suggest that they're not going to the Hellenistic Decapolis city of Pella, which was very pro-Roman, by the way, and loyal to Rome in the revolt. But they're living in this wadi where Jesus himself had hid the last winter of his life. So I asked Balaj to take my picture and create a scene for me. This is Jesus, but it would be the same with Simon. But Simon would have been with him if he's one of the twelve. So he's taking them back to the place where they had once hid out. This is mentioned 
uh, I think, obliquely in the book of Revelation, where the woman flees from the dragon into the wilderness to her place where she's nourished for three and a half years. Elijah nourished, the, the verb is the same, Elijah is fed by ravens in this same wadi, it's called Kareth in the Hebrew Bible. If you look on the Oxford map, the brook Kareth where Elijah is fed. And so there's this memory of the community living in this wadi. I've been there a number of times, it's just spectacular to go there. Uh, cliffs and caves everywhere and waterfalls and it's, it's beautiful and uh, people could survive there. And then they went back to Jerusalem from the records we have after the war, probably around 73, they go back. And they set up a, a synagogue on Mount Zion, uh, Bargill Pixner has done a lot of work on this. The little church on Mount Zion that he's identified the structure as a first century guest house. <clears throat> that article's on my website, by the way. So we have uh, place remains like this and tombs. We have the wadi and we have texts. In terms of texts, I think the two, t we have Q. Uh, which I'm not picturing here, and we have the Didache. This is a fragment of a manuscript of the Didache. Uh, the Didache, the best manuscript is in Jerusalem. Now it was found in Constantinople, but now it's in Jerusalem at one of the monasteries there. But I really encourage you to read the Didache. It's, Bart Ehrman has a new translation of it in that Loeb edition of the Apostolic Fathers. It's two volumes, not a bad thing to purchase. It's uh, Greek, and it's a document you want to uh, absorb and look at uh, because Didache means teaching. It, the title is The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, and it really differs in many ways from Pauline Christianity. It'll remind you a lot of the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are two ways, you know, and then that, doesn't it sort of sound like the Punity Rule, and then you list all these things? It's got these really lovely images. If you're giving money, let your gifts sweat in your hand until you know to whom you're giving it. I think that's great, isn't it? And it has the ring. It's got the ring of, uh, you know, like, I don't know, we'll have to ask Charlie if we voted. Did he say it? Did he not say it? Might he said it? But, you know, I don't think anybody would say, oh, absolutely not. He couldn't have said something like that. It sounds likes the kind of thing that you find. Lots of other things in the Didache. Now, we are reading a really late copy of it, and so it does have some interpolations. Like somebody slipped in a Trinitarian baptism formula that we're pretty sure baptized them three times in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the same guy that put that Matthew <laughs> edition in. He just went around and just added that anywhere he could find a text, I guess, I don't know, but it's just sort of odd, isn't it? The Eucharist service is very interesting. I noticed in that Megiddo book, they quote the Didache Eucharist service because they think that mosaic reflects more the Didache. It's Christian, but it seems to have a different edge to it. Take a look. And then the letter of James. Here's the oldest fragment of the letter of James. It's on a piece of papyrus. Um, that also is a surviving remnant. Until I began to read April's work and meet her, I had not considered that Thomas could be a valuable part of this recoverable tradition. I love the verse on James, but that's about all I read. Kept reading that verse over and over. Go to James, okay, go to James, go to James. But then you have to ask, why would a document that sounds to us so Gnostic and different be pushing James because we don't think of James as that type and I think you've solved that problem for us. That it's a document with accretions and additions but we can go back to that original core and divide it you know, pretty easily and what do we find? Uh, that it's got these parallels with Q as well. I think Hebrew Matthew as you've heard this week is part of the picture. 
I think the pseudo-Clementines are part of the picture. These are what Crossan calls the dark ages of the, uh, of the movement. That is, we don't have a lot of text, but we've got pieces of things. But I'm thankful for what we have, and I think if we can recover that tradition and put it over against the Pauline tradition and compare them, one is a kind of a lost Christianity or a forgotten Christianity, which is the seminar I was about, and the other is a Christianity that uh, dominated somewhat. Although, frankly, uh, uh, I don't think Paul's vision was taken up too much by the church either later. I mean, Paul's used a lot. But Paul, uh, until Augustine comes along, uh, Paul is mainly the hero who traveled east and west and spread the glorious gospel and suffered and was persecuted. If you say, and what did he say? It's like, oh, well, he just like preached good things. You know, the gospel. But as far as reading that and getting uh, the, the Pauline message, it seems to be Augustine that just recovers it at the deepest level. And then after Augustine, I don't know church history that well, you know, beyond, I mean, my church history stops like 20 years after Jesus died, basically. <laughs> so, no, I'll go to 70 with you. But still, uh, maybe Luther, you know, and then Kierkegaard and people like that, the existentialists and Boltmann, who got, abs who got totally moved by uh, Bonhoeffer, you know, the Pauline message. It's very powerful. Tillich. I mean, Paul in the 20th century is just amazing at a high theological level. Uh, Borncom, who's a Boltmann student. Some of you studied all these things and know some of these great uh, thinkers. So it represents a way that uh, can be taken up, but this alternative way, this lost Christianity, 